Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Virendra, and I am a student of uh, Information Systems final, final semester. So basically, about me, I have like around uh, seven years of experience as a cloud engineer. So I worked back in my home country for around six years, and in United States also, I worked for around uh, one year in IBM. So I did my internship with IBM as a cloud engineer only. Uh, talking about uh, like how I got inclined towards the cloud and what was my first exposure. So initially I started my career as a backend developer only. And uh, there in the organization, uh, we had an opportunity to work or to move our on-premises solution to the cloud. And that's where I first got the opportunity towards the cloud. It was new thing at that time. It was very booming at that time. So I realized the potential of it and uh, I shifted my profile from completely a backend developer to a cloud engineer, which is a combination of both uh, cloud as well as the backend development. In cloud engineering, basically what you do is you develop your application, which is like compatible to the cloud, which is called, also called as cloud native applications. And then you deploy those cloud native application on any of the public, private or hybrid model. So that's where I got the exposure. I migrated the entire solution from on-premises to the cloud and I started learning about it at that moment. This was the thing in 2015 when I graduated and got my first opportunity to work on this cloud. And after that, I found my inclination. Okay, this is what something I wanted to do in future. I worked, worked on that thing for a longer period of like around five to six years. Uh, I got like exposure toward the enterprise levels of tools and technology, which required for the cloud computing. It's not like only the cloud. It's not like AWS or Microsoft or uh, GCP. There are several other technologies which needs to be accomplished or combined with your cloud. For example, Docker, Kubernetes. So these are like enterprise levels of tools and technology, which you need to have a good understanding in order to excel in this particular field. So in my different uh, organizations exposure, I got the opportunity to work on these things. And then uh, in, since when I got like, okay, I have good exposure and I wanted to like have like basic understanding about this also, I decided to pursue the masters and I came to United States. So this is about me. I know it's, it was like too much, but that's okay. <laughs> So let's start with our, our presentation today. So first of all, what is cloud computing actually? In a layman's language, how do you understand a cloud computing? So cloud computing is nothing, but it's an infrastructure provided by someone else and you are utilizing it for your purpose without worrying about it. Consider it like a situation, uh, let's say you want to build your house. Just, just an example to understand this thing in more appropriate and more uh, important way. Let's say you are building your house and you you don't have expertise to build that thing. You don't know, you don't want to get involved in the technical technicalities like bringing the material or talking to the laborers and asking them to build them for a proper way. So what you will do, you will go to a house construction company and you will ask them, I have money, I will give it to you. Can you please build a house for me and give it to me? The material, the design, whatever is according to you. I don't want to take any pain. Give it to me and once it is ready, let me know. I will pay you and I will shift into that house and I will utilize that house for my sake. So in the same way, cloud computing is something that you ask to a provider, for example, AWS, that for my requirement, for my organization's requirement, I need a EC2 instance, or a server, which is easy to instance, or a storage device, which is S3, or for that matter, anything like a Route 53 or XYZ. So you, you will ask the AWS provider, okay, can you please give me that? And AWS provider, what they will do is they will provide all the required infrastructure to you. You can utilize them and you can deploy your application, serve your purpose and uh, serve to the customers with your application. The purpose basically for what you developed the application. In this case, you do not have to take the pain of creating the infrastructure altogether from the beginning. In that way, you will save your money, you will save your time. And as soon as your work is done, you can leave that thing and come out of it. The AWS will automatically take care of that and you have to pay, pay only the amount of utilization you have done for that particular resource. Now, the thing is that 
so these are the things which cloud computing offers these are the these are the benefits which cloud computing offers for example pay as you go on demand so you can go through the slides i do not need the slide for explaining all these things because this is something which i do on the regular basis i don't want to read all those things this is for you people you can read it later and if you have any questions you can let me know now let's talk about the thing that why the cloud computing or cloud came in picture for that first matter so the reason was that before cloud the thing was if you have to develop something if you want to deploy something it has to be on your on premises solution in that way what was the problem is it is local to your organization you you will definitely find difficulty in scaling your infrastructure for example uh, let's talk about uh, a bill a sale or a kind of you know you have a shopping cart application with you and that requires a spike or that will have a spike during the black friday or any cyber monday or some some other days so in that phase on, on those particular two days only you will have a huge load on your application so if you have hundreds of servers which is required in on premises like before cloud so in before cloud what do you have to do what your organizations used to do is like they used to build the entire infrastructure for themselves they used to buy the facility they used to host their servers on the, that facility so that is an extra burden to the organization because they have to build it they have to maintain it they have to keep a security guard or the people who are there in case of any outage to handle that at particular moment so that is an extra over burden for the organizations so and let's say you have a shop of the organization have a shopping cart organization so in that case they need to buy some more infrastructure like some resources some ec2 instance they have to buy like in advance because they don't know that okay when the load is going to come but if it is going to come installing a server is not a easy task it requires proper installation proper technicians and to make it up it again requires a time to pass the load the request which are coming to your application to that server so it requires a huge amount of time and effort so that cannot be done in a minute or an hour or in a day it requires so in that case what you, they used to do they used to buy the servers they used to keep it into the stock of okay if suppose any day that is kind of a prediction that if any day the load comes to our application these servers will help us to handle that load but you tell me one thing is it a good approach no it is not a good approach why because they are just expecting that load to raise on their application which is totally based on the demand and supply actually it might not be possible that that load actually happens and if it happens it will happen only for a day or two but for the rest of the 360 or 362 days the servers are empty and they are not doing any task but the companies or the organization had to pay for them so that was the major issue scaling was the major issue before cloud now what happens is like as soon as the cloud came in the organization stopped doing all those things they do not have their own infrastructure they do not have to buy anything in advance what they have to do is they have to tell to the providers we need these many resources right now that is enough for us in order to serve the customers because we have this much of bandwidth for the customers but as soon as the peak days like black friday or Uh, cyber monday will come we might require to increase our load so you can configure proper load balancing proper auto scaling so as soon as the load will come your same replication of your already existing ec2 or a server will spike and will serve the um, additional customers so in that way they do not have to pay the cost of additional server for 365 days only for one day because that is the spike day they have to pay for it so that was the major advantage the scaling was the major advantage for uh, with the cloud and it was a drawback for the before cloud actually and that's the reason this has been came in picture and popular become so popular now now the another thing is the another issue with before cloud was that let's say you are a startup and you do not have that much of capital to install the server or create a particular facility so in that case those startups used to be on on premise and they were not able to serve the customers or not able to reach to the customers which they were expecting to do so it was a blocker the capital was a blocker for the small startups because big organizations had money so they could like afford creating an infrastructure or maintaining a proper facility for installing their servers and everything but it was not a possible thing for the small size companies 
but cloud has given an opportunity to them to scale their business to launch their application on a server which is not hosted by them and they do not have to pay an extra amount they have to pay only for what they are using so in that way it has been promoted the cloud has given a support or a push to the startup culture also so if you see the startup culture after 2015 or 16 only we are able to see a lot of startups are coming in the market and in 2021 or 22 it was like the biggest because they have the opportunity they have the platform to launch their application and serve the customer they wanted to serve without worrying about the initial cost actually i would say so that that was the comparison why before the cloud what was happening and after cloud what has happened so this is the network architecture for the cloud computing so what exactly happens you have a infrastructure at a particular center location and this center location is nothing but the aws facility so aws facility has all the servers installed in it i'm giving you an example it can be an example of azure also at it can be example of gcp also but aws is my personal favorite because i have worked on that a lot so that's why i always quote the example of aws so this is a facility this is not something which is in the sky or dynamically happening it's like a physical on premises system located in north virginia ohio china india everywhere they have their facility and from that facility we just have to ask okay in which facility we want to provision our infrastructure and on the basis of that we will get a infrastructure on our local system and we start we will we'll get a connection to that server on in our local machine and we can start deploying our servers as well as applications on the top of it so this was a basic architecture for the cloud computing i try to kept it like basic so that everyone will understand so from here this system suppose you are working on this system and you want, you have to you have a application which you want to deploy on a cloud and want that okay every other people will use it so what you will do you will you you will make a connection from here to this server and deploy your application then other people can make utilization of that thing that's like a basic network architecture for the cloud computing there are so many things if you if you go in the deep of the networking it's like a it's it's it it is like a itself a big topic network i don't know uh, if you if some of you are from computer science undergrad background uh, we had a chapter we had an entire syllabus uh, subject for the networking so if you go into the deep of networking it's like a huge thing but like on the high level this is this is what the architecture followed by cloud let's move to the next so basically we talked about cloud now in cloud also there are seg we have like a public cloud we have a private cloud and we have a hybrid model so basically public cloud is something which will easily available and can be accessible to anybody on internet now example of uh, public cloud is aws azure or gcp for that matter so basically what happens is like let's say you are a new organization you do not worry about a uh, security concerns or anything you are like a shopping cart application so what you do you just have to provision your application on any any public cloud with no upfront cost and it should be highly scalable means if it is required to spike the load you the cloud should be able to serve it and it should be able to manage the load without any breakage so the first priority or the first preference will be given to a public cloud so in public cloud uh, basically what you do is you just go to the provider okay i need this kind of or this much of infrastructure that's it i i'm not worried about security concerns i'm not worrying about my uh, initial cost or upfront cost anything i just go ask to the providers and deploy my application and done now there is a issue in this thing what is the issue in the public clouds public cloud is like super easy they are good they are like easily accessible to you you can scale your application as your wish but there is a major issue the issue is like let's say you are a banking application now you are giving your data let's say my application is a banking application you are a customer you are coming to me you are opening your account you are depo depositing your money everything but your entire credentials and everything is stored in my database and i am giving that database to the aws now aws can make use of it anyway correct if there is a security breach and the data can lost you will lose your money and i will lose my customer and my business will be down so this is the biggest issue which in theoretical this is the issue but in practical it, this never happened there was some issue happened there was some incident where there was a data breach in aws but that was like taken under the control so this is 
considered as a major issue with the public clouds. Because of that, there is a, another model which came in the picture for the cloud and that was private model. Now, pri private model is specifically meant for the organization which works on the sensitive information. For example, banking is like one of the biggest example of this one. If you have a banking information, the private cloud is nothing but it's kind of an on-premises solution on your uh, premises or on, on, on your own facility which is completely maintained and controlled by the organization itself. They are not going to give their solution or their database or their data to the third party. So in that case, what will happen is, so in that case, what will happen is um, the data is secured, but in this case, it's coming with one facility or one advantage, but there are so many other advantages. If you have same infrastructure on, on premises, which is a private cloud, considered as a private cloud, then you will have that same issue the cloud was developed. And that is like scalability. If you have a, enough load, you will not be able to handle that lo load because you, your, your, your infrastructure, your private cloud is not that much capable to scale up. So that is the, again, we are going back to the on-premises, we are using the private. But private has a facility to provide the sensitive information or to secure the sensitive information. For this, you require the huge initial capital also because you have to set up the entire infrastructure for you. It's like same thing which I explained earlier that you have your servers, you have your infrastructure ready with you and then you keep everything with you and then you deploy your application on the top of it. To solve the problems of private cloud as well as public cloud, there was another model or another type of was introduced and called as hybrid model. Now, hybrid model is something which provides the facility of both public as well as private cloud. Let's say you have an application. In that application, you have the front end and back end part and you have a database. Now, what happens in the uh, hybrid model is you take your database, put it on the private cloud, which means your on-premises solution. Keep your entire application, rest of the entire application on the public cloud. Now, you have your scalability also and your data is also stored in your private network, which means you have a full control on your data and database related operations. Whereas your application is able to handle any kind of load because it's deployed on a private cloud, for example, AWS, which can scale at any level. So that's the best thing uh, hybrid model, uh, model offered. I worked on hybrid model from my second organization and I found that, okay, these are the good things benefits which hybrid model provides, which is not associated with public and private. But remember one thing, hybrid model is not a new thing. It's a combination of public and private, which we, which we already had. We just combined them together so that we got another third model. So this was about the uh, public, private and hybrid model. So we have the examples also like public is AWS and Azure, you already know that uh, private is like, IBM cloud, I would say IBM cloud is considered as a private cloud because it is associated with IBM only. They have their own premises solutions, which are where they are deploying all the things because I was working on that IBM cloud only in the last, uh, last year. So that is like a more secure way. But then again, it has a huge cost and scalability limitations. Talking about hybrid model, AWS Outpost is one of the biggest example which provide data on the premises, I mean on premises or in a private cloud and your entire rest of the application on a public cloud. So that is an example of a uh, hybrid model. Now let's talk about the service model. So basically what do you mean by service model? So we talked about, <clears throat> excuse me. We talked about what is cloud computing. We talked about like, uh, what kind of clouds we have now, how to use them, how to make proper utilization of these clouds. So for making the proper utilization, cloud computing came with the different types of services. I will give an example. I will explain you these things with example only that will make this thing more easy. I don't want to go in more technical terms because it might be possible that the audience does not have that much of information about the technical terms. So. Let's talk about the first service model, which is infrastructure as a service, which is also called as IaaS. And the second one is uh, platform as a service, which is also called as PaaS. And the third one is software as a service, which is also called as SaaS.
Now let's talk about first as infrastructure service. There are some information given about that here. You can read about it. It's like more of theoretical thing, but let me explain you in a different way. Let's take an example of, and I will try to explain all three in an analogy so that you, know, you will able to understand the difference between these three services in together. <clears throat> so let's say you have a pizza, uh, you want to uh, eat a pizza and you have this uh, thing that, okay, there are three ways of preparing the pizza or having the pizza actually, or you wanted to throw a pizza party and you are planning that how to do, do it. Do I prepare my pizza at my home? Should I order it or should I buy the ingredients or the grocery which is required for it or the tools which is required in order to prepare it and then I will do it. So first thing, first, first scenario. Let's say you decide that, okay, I need only ingredients. I know the steps, how to prepare the pizza. I have my machines, like for example, oven and everything I have with me, only the ingredients are not there. Let's say I want to... Uh, prepare a cheese margarita and for that I need cheese and all the other stuffs like vegetables and everything and the base and everything those things I don't have but I have oven with me I know how to prepare it so what you will do you will go to the grocery store ask them can you please help me with these these ingredients and I will do my job on, on my own what what grocery store will do he will provide you the base and the cheese and everything he will give it to you now what you will do for the amount of ingredients you have bought from the grocery store, you have paid only for that, like 100 bucks. You came home, you started building the, starting preparing the pizza by yourself. You set up the base, you put the garnishing, you did everything on your own, except that ingredient which you bought from the uh, store. And then you, what you did, you put it into the oven and the pizza is ready for you to eat. This is called as infrastructure as a service. You asked for the computing resources from the cloud provider and then rest of the work, you do it by yourself, creating the application, deploying the application, using or managing the infrastructure by yourself. It's just that they are hosted on their facility. That's it. They have given you that. Okay, this is an EC2 instance. Now on the top of it, you want to deploy a node application, Java application, your database, whatever. We are not concerned about that. This is your EC2 instance, take it and you have to pay for how long you are going to use it. So that is called as infrastructure as a service. Now let's move to the next part, which is, and the example of that thing is like AWS. AWS is like acts as a infrastructure service because we go to it, we ask, we need a S3 bucket, we need a EC2 instance and we are done. We'll do our rest of the work. So this is, these are the examples for that thing. Now let's move to the next platform as a service. We'll, we'll take the questions in it. You can keep the questions ready. <clears throat> now let's take the uh, example of platform as a service. Now let's say you have the same scenario. You have to throw a pizza party. You have to prepare a pizza or you have to have a pizza to, to serve to everyone which is coming to your house. <clears throat> now in case of pass or platform as a service, what you will do, you know, you don't know how to prepare the pizza and you don't have the ingredients also. Now what you will do, you will go to the grocery market or to someone who is like seasoned person in preparing the pizza. You will go to them. Okay, can you please help me with all the ingredients? What all ingredients I need in order to prepare a cheese margarita? He or she will write all the ingredients and give it to you. Then again, you will say, okay, I don't have oven also. Can you please help me with that also? He or she will give you the oven also. And then lastly, he will. you will say, okay, can you give me the step-by-step -step process, what to do after getting those ingredients and till the time I will get a proper pan or baked pizza. So those written steps will be also given to you from a seasoned person who already know how to prepare a pizza. So in this case, you are just taking everything from outside, even the steps to prepare the pizza along with the ingredients as well as the machinery required in order to do that thing. You're taking everything outside from outside but you're doing by yourself. That's it. You're just combining all the information which you got from the outside world, combining it and serving it. That's it. That is called as platform as a service. You ask for Heroku or Microsoft Azure as a service or Google app as an engine that I need to know how to build an application. They will tell you how to build an application, what infrastructure you need, everything they will give it to you what you have to do, you have to just take that application 
and put it on the infrastructure which is provided by the different cloud providers. That is called as PaaS as a service. Now let's move to the next service type, SaaS as a service. SaaS as a service is the simplest one to understand. You want to serve or you want to throw a pizza party. You do not have to do anything. You just planned today or Saturday night or Sunday night, I want to throw a pizza party. You just call to the um, any pizza store. Let's say university pizza you call. <clears throat> I need 100 pizzas because I have a pizza party. That's it. They will prepare it, bake it, do it, everything for you and deliver it to your home. You just have to serve to the customer, to, the, to your um, the guest actually. That is called a SaaS service. You do not have to do anything. Just ask, you will get and you will utilize it. You do not have to bake it. You do not have to put the ingredients together. You do not have to worry about anything. You just have to pay for the service what you are asking for. The best example is Gmail, <clears throat> which we are using every day. That is a SaaS service. Pre-built, deployed and given to you at your doorstep. You just have to write the email and send it to everyone. You, you are not developing the code for Gmail. <clears throat> not deploying it anywhere, nothing you are doing. You are just asking, okay, I need a Gmail. You created the account and you started using from the day one. Another good example is Office 365, <clears throat> which we are using every day. <clears throat> so these are the differences which we have in different uh, cloud service models. I hope you got the idea. I try to explain it in a very easy way. Okay. So these are some of the advantages we have for the cloud. For example, scalability, accessibility, collaboration, reliability. So these all are like offered by cloud. And for that purpose only, cloud is coming to a next level now. I would tell you, I would like to tell you one thing. I don't know in which semester you are in, but remember one thing, 21st century is ruled by cloud as of now. So if you are planning for backend developer, frontend developer, or DevOps, or cloud engineer, or data engineer, data scientist, whatever you are doing, you need to know cloud, at least one cloud. Some basic things you need to know if you want to grab a job, a good job in the market. So it's really important. This is, the, this is one of the biggest requirement for the engineers in 21st century. So make sure that you have good information not like excellent, but you have reasonable amount of information with you that if someone is asking you anything, you will be able to answer that. And that will definitely help you land a job because this is like my personal experience. I experienced that. I followed the path and then I reached here. This is my last semester. So I have been to that journey which you are going through right now or you are some of you are already there in the final semester. So we are on the same page actually. And as a student only, I'm telling you that this is something which you have to invest your time in give like one hour or two hour every day and you will be good. You will start seeing the difference. Your resume start will picking up in for the different rules and you will get an upper edge actually if you have this thing in your, uh, in your resume. So these are some of the uh, benefits which or the advantages of the cloud computing which we get and for that purpose only we use it. <clears throat> these are some of the disadvantages that uh, you will feel like, okay, if cloud has only advantages, why we are talking about the disadvantages and if it is becoming popular. Every technological term which comes in the market will have both the coins, the left side as well as the right side. So this is the right side actually, that disadvantages. For everything we have disadvantages. So first thing is it's based out of internet. If you are not connected with internet, it's a problem. You will not be able to, you will not be able to access the cloud or your resources. Second thing is, if you are not created your own resources, you will have very less control on it. it. If your pizza is prepared by you and at the end moment, you feel like, okay, no, some sauce is missing or I need to add a tinge of garlic also in that. You can do it by yourself because that is your product. You have developed that, thing, that pizza. But if you have ordered it from the store, you will not be able to do it because they have a specific standard to prepare it. They will prepare it and give it to you. It's your choice. You want to take it or not. So you will get a limited control if you are on the cloud, if as compared to on-premises. You can have downtime or outages because everything is on internet. So it, it's like a normal thing, which practically is very less possibility, I guess, because 
these providers and everything works on very large scale but yeah that is that can be considered as one of the drawback of the cloud but i would not say it's like a drawback or it, it's it should be your uh, you know the deciding point i should go or scale my application on cloud or no. it should not be second is again the internet related if its speed is less or something like that cost should not be but sometimes if you are not aware of a particular resource or device okay how to use it proper utilization if you are not aware of that's what i said you should have decent amount of information to make sure that you are utilizing any resource efficiently and effectively let's say you don't know which ec2 instance will be better to serve your application and you are deploying a ec2 instance x large as compared to medium definitely your cost will spike so you should have a good understanding or a basic knowledge that to use it properly actually and security as i mentioned earlier that if it is a private cloud for that purpose only we came to the uh, so if, if it is a public cloud then only we came to the private security is a concern with the public clouds actually because your data is exposed it never happened there are some incidents but it's very it's, it's not like frequent thing to happen okay so security is one of the challenges which we have to take in consideration for that we have came up with a model called as hybrid model which is helping us to solve these kind of problem security related issues in fact uh, aws and all are like i was reading a news few days back and uh, aws is like making their infrastructure or their servers more secure they are investing a huge amount of money in their security as compared to like releasing the services because as you see when i started career it was like 60 or 70 services but now we have around 300 services i don't know the exact data but around 300 services we have live right now from the aws so they release the service every other month or i would say every other week also <laughs> it might be possible so that was the thing but they started investing in their security also because some incident happened in few years and which was a, a business a controller for aws also so they are working on those parts also so this is about the presentation uh i have this much information only you can have so thank you for thank you very much for hearing me out uh, if you have any questions please let me know i'm ha happy to answer you yeah what was your question my question was the infrastructure as so suppose we are uh, taking the data that may be the infrastructure as well right we are using one infrastructure that is on cloud so basically infrastructure as a this question again. So, yeah so the question is uh if we are utilizing clouds database will it consider as a infrastructure as a service or not so the thing is infrastructure as a service it will consider as infrastructure service but the thing is that infrastructure is mostly related to the computing things for example if you have a laptop but that laptop is not there on the cloud so they will provide a virtual machine called as ec2 instance to you and you will take your thing and put it there for example your application rds or for that matter which is a relational database service which is provided by aws is also come it, it comes under the infrastructure only but then in that case you have to make sure that how to utilize it it is given by the infrastructure it is given by the aws then you have to make sure that how to utilize it so all the infra is given by you by the aws to you but then you have to decide how to utilize it for example as i gave you the example of pizza you buy the ingredient from outside ingredients will be everything like the base and everything but then uh, how to combine them and you know uh, proper create proper utilization of it that is like more important thing in infrastructure as a service that you have to do by yourself any other question you have like online also you can ask me if you have any other question uh, sorry i didn't get you what is that why the security will become a problem so uh the question is like incomplete security become a problem where is it like uh, in total in the cloud or is it like uh, in the public model it is like a problem so i will answer both the things i am not sure like what was the question in what context you have asked the question so security is a major concern in cloud, uh, cloud because you are renting out something very precious to you to someone else for example you have a gold chain or you have your mercedes with you let's say i will give an example of that you have a mercedes with you you are giving it to me 
because you don't want to take the risk of it to maintain to handle you don't have proper storage to put it so you are giving it to me can you please keep this thing for me and i will use it whenever i need it your mercedes for your mercedes you have paid a lot lot amount of money correct so that is the problem you will be always concerned that whether i will be able to take care of that thing or not it might be possible that the security in my house where i'm keeping your mercedes does not have a gated uh, security or does not have a lock actually over there it can be stolen from there correct so that is the problem you are giving your precious thing which is the data in our application in our case in the software engineers life engineers life the main important thing is data we are giving it to someone else and that's where we are concerned about and that's where the security breaches happen now let's talk about the same concept with respect to public cloud now how a security is a problem in a public cloud because public cloud is something which is there outside which is there with the third party you don't have control over it you are just blindly trusting that person or that organization to handle your things and that's where it becomes sometimes a problem with the uh, public clouds but whereas in private cloud you are keeping your mercedes in your own garage and you know that how your how the security at your own garage so that's the uh that's how the security becomes a issue or a concern in case of cloud do we have any other question on the zoom so the next question is what instances are the different service models used security or editing of the application is a specific why is the um is it there on the zoom yes okay let me check mm -hmm. So which question you are reading? Under one security. Okay. In what instances are the different service models used? The security or editing of the application is a disadvantage. Why is the infrastructure is still used? Okay. Now infrastructure as a service, why it is used? The first thing in the infrastructure, the advantage of infrastructure as a service is. you are getting the entire control as i mentioned while giving the example let's say you prepared you got the ingredients from outside that is also as per your own need i need ginger i need garlic i need a uh, sauce i need whatever x y z i i don't know how to prepare the pizza so i'm not that good in that but yeah whatever it is like required like a pizza pizza base or a cheese or whatever it is you have to decide those ingredients also it's not the shopkeeper or the grocery person is going to tell you okay you can use this use that also it's not like that you have a list with you you will give it to the grocery store and grocery store will give exactly same thing which has which which, which is asked by you that is called as control at initial level i need only the infrastructure which i have to use for my application it's not like some random infrastructure which i am not sure what is the advantage and what is the disadvantage how much money will will it cost to me on how much will there be any alternative for it there is no information about that in in front of me so what i will do that i am playing blind over there whereas in case of infrastructure as a code or infrastructure as a service i am giving all the instructions or details for each and every resource i need second thing is you are deploying everything by yourself on that infrastructure so then again you have a control you want to deploy only rds or you want to deploy your entire application for the storage purpose you want to use your local storage or you want to use the s3 as a storage services you want to host your domain name on a different uh, domain provider or you have to use aws or for that matter any provider service route 53 or example anything so in a infrastructure as a service you have a full control on your infrastructure as well as your application and that's the biggest advantage i would say because no no organization want to give the full control to a third person whom they don't want to trust blindly and that's like a good choice actually any banking sector if you take or any service any any organization which is associated with the security never take this chance they will do everything by themselves just they take a small help which is provide as a platform provide as a infrastructure and we will do everything by ourselves and provide the infrastructure also as per our need so i have hope that answers your question since the hybrid is a combination of private and public does it have a tendency of being more safe less safe or in between 
definitely if you use the hybrid model in a appropriate way it will have a highest benefits and that's where most of the biggest organizations are using hybrid model instead of using a public specifically public or specifically private model they are using hybrid model almost i have worked like for around four organization till now and every organization i have seen they are except the first one because we started with that organization except for that three organization which i worked for till now they are they were on the hybrid model so that's the that's the answer to you you should know how to use the hybrid model properly then hybrid model is like the best thing how to use it properly keep your database on on premises your data is entirely safe which means keep your database in private structure and rest of the things in public structure which is public public cloud that's it you are done you do not have to scale your database correct database does not require scaling if it requires also create two servers create three servers because you know that it will not be more than that but for application it can be more than that correct <clears throat> also in terms of cloud cloud engineering what coding coding language are used often and what's the relationship between cloud engineer and data engineer so coding language uh, can be anything yeah uh, so basically i worked on java uh, my when i started my career my back end stack was uh, struts with java when i did my second uh, when i switched to a different organization and when i did my uh, internship with ibm i was working on spring boot with java as a back end framework along with that python is really important right now because if you if you don't know python you should know shell scripting i got interviews and i got selected in the organization because i had shell scripting knowledge i didn't know python earlier but after going to ibm i because their entire code base was entirely on the python uh, i mean the infrastructure part was entirely on python i switched from bash to python and i realized one thing learning bash is so difficult but learning python is that easy so if you are just starting better to invest your time in learning python for scripting as compared to bash scripting because bash scripting is difficult to learn it requires time but if you learn it it's like directly communication with the machine so it's like faster than that provides so many other benefits also but python is really good i would say so i learned that thing uh, in my previous organization but you should have at least one experience either linux or say shell scripting or bash scripting or python either of them should be there with you uh what is the relationship between cloud engineering and so let's say you have a you are like a cloud engineer now what happens is like let's say you you want to build the data pipeline so basically uh, as per my understanding data engineers what they do they extract the data from the different source and then they work or they manipulate the data and start working on that thing that's what my understanding about data data engineers but how the cloud engineering help them is they can build the pipelines to extract the data so that extraction of data manual process from there will be completely removed it's like it can be scaled to any level you can extract a huge amount of data within the minute uh, within the seconds actually and start manipulating it start working on the top of it so airflow is one of the best example for the data engineers in the cloud computing which is like a service of gcp highly used and highly reliable so many organizations are using right now so and if you so basically when you start exploring about it you will also know the other benefits of cloud computing in data engineering this is like one of the thing which i told you so yeah it's it's like useful everywhere it's not like i am a back end engineer so that's useful for me or i am a full stack that's that's why it is useful for me even if you are a tester or it guy also definitely it is useful for you because you can write your uh, selenium scripts for the testers i'm talking you you can write your test case and everything on cloud and start provisioning the infrastructure sorry ec2 instance and deploy your regression suits on the ec2 instance you do not require just start it and leave it create the pipelines jenkins pipelines or uh, for that matter travis pipelines or github actions you can write whatever you want to do just on one click you just start it as soon as the new change will come from the developer a new build will be created and get deployed on ec2 instance that's it and you are done you can go do your own work and after like 15 20 minutes you will get the results in your hand you do not have to so it's, so basically we are right now in a state that everyone is moving towards the automation and cloud is something which is giving you to do that automation or devops for that matter is giving you that privilege to do that uh, automation so you have to think in that way that why it is coming it's coming because we are moving towards the automation and basically if you want to go from united states to uh europe 
you need a flight and that flight in our case we are moving towards the automation in our case the flight is devops or cloud any other question please let me know i have one question mm -hmm. so if you said that uh, so I have worked on GitLab, mm -hmm. GitLab or Ocean, Azure and GitLab. So to create a new instance, we need to uh, we, we have to add the configuration, the details in our GitLab configuration file. So same will be the case in uh, same will be the case for AWS, right? It's, it's so basically, whatever you are talking about, there is called as CI/CD, continuous integration, continuous deployment. For that only, you need the infrastructure. So for AWS, GCP, Azure, it does not depend which cloud you are using. The process will, will always remain same. You have to create the resource, de deploy, deploy this thing. For that, you need to do the configuration. So, but that, that depends actually which cloud provider you are using. The configuration changes, but you have to do the configuration. So that can, that can be done using GitLab, GitHub, or any. Anything. So basically, GitHub and GitLab are like expensive to use. Because they provide with a limitation, you will if you are using a free account or organization don't want to invest on that the, those kind of tools because basically organizations have a tendency to use the open source tools. For example, Jenkins is widely popular in the current market as a CI/CD tool because it is open source. It comes up with a huge community support with a lot of plugins to serve a specific or any kind of requirement. For that matter, for orchestration, we have Kubernetes as well as we have OpenShift also. But people are, a lot of organizations are using Kubernetes, not OpenShift, because OpenShift is paid and it is under, under the Linux of REHF. You have to pay for them. So Red Hat has owned that OpenShift, correct? So Red Hat came with that another abstraction lever on the top of Kubernetes and it made it licensed. So that's the one thing. Any other thing, if you have, let me know. Do you want to share your experience in like co-op search and your internship experience in like, yeah. like a full-time service right yeah. now in the market? Yeah, you know? share your job search experience and like interview experience. So uh, basically, let's talk about the internship first, the co-op one. <clears throat> I know that the uh, market situation is not good right now which is like evident to everybody. I will not lie on that thing that, okay, no, it is very good and you have to find it. I will not do that thing because I am like a student. I am one of you only. But I would say that when I was searching for the co-op or internship, it was better than the current situation. But then only I would, I would like to make a quote here that if you have skills, right skills actually, not some random skills you have with you. If you have right skills according to your domain or according to your field in which you want to target your career for example for me my target skill was backend as as well as the cloud these two things i kept in mind and i continuously worked on those things in fact in information system the high the, the hardest course which is like advanced cloud computing and the cloud computing i took it when i was on my internship and i was searching for my internship i took it at that time i took that risk to not lose the opportunity to study that I took that. I learned a lot from that course. On the other hand, I was working on my backend skills also. And I knew that, and frankly speaking, I didn't apply for a lot of organizations. It was very limited for me, mostly 50 or 100 organizations I applied and I got like good offers actually, not only one, but multiple. But the thing is that you have to keep your track right. You have to keep your mindset clear, okay, in which domain I wanted to go and work on those stacks every day us is a very big market it's not like that people are not going to everyone is going to get the job but the time is like different right now not right now you will get but in a month or two but then you have to make sure that whenever the call comes to you and your profile gets shortlisted for any of the role you are 100 percent sure that that call will get converted to a offer letter because it might be possible that you will get a call people are getting the call in my case also when I was searching, there were so many students who, who were getting the calls every day. But the issue was they were not able to convert because they didn't have the right skill set. You have to keep your skill set up to the mark. You have to make sure that if the interviewer has asked one thing, I will be able to tell him two things. I always believe in that. And your skill, 
developing thing should not be should not never stop actually look for the profiles actually let's say you have a job description you are looking for it you see okay java is there spring boot is there i know java and spring boot but there is a aws services also which is not there in my resume what is that and that has been asked in so many job descriptions from so many organizations which means this is popular thing correct right down this has this has a demand in the market why can't i learn like that thing in like a 10 or 5 days and then apply start applying for the other opportunities which i have available with me because we are engineers we do not require month 3 month or 10 months to learn a stack it's like a two days task for everyone i learned python in in like 15 or 10 days and i never touched python before that before my ibm experience and i started i developed the application i developed so many features over there in the python itself but then you should have that ability or that you know that enthusiasm that okay i have to do it i all i, I means it's not like that you know, i i always be in the books or i will always keep like studying about the technology or the stacks i do all the other stuff also but whenever i do i just do it with 100% dedication so that the task which other people will take 10 days i will do it in one or two days so you have to make sure that read the description check out that what is missing from there what i do not carry with the other people who are getting the calls have there in resume and start working on that thing and don't worry about that if you have right skill set you will definitely be picked it not today but tomorrow that's means that's one that's my personal experience as of now till now i believe in that only i do not feel like okay i if i'm, if I'm applying for 1000 application then only i am a successful person if i am applying for 10 and i'm getting two calls and i'm able to convert one i am more successful than people who are applying for 1000 jobs so that's the what type of questions you were asked for so basically it was a senior uh, cloud engineer position uh, for the internship when i went there so uh, they basically asked so it's like normal first round was like the um, online assessment which i got which i had like two portions of the programming of your own choice so i gave it into the java and the other portions which they asked was create a script kubernetes script which will create which will have a docker image pulled and for that docker image uh, there will be a network created already that network should attach to your container then container will be orchestrated by the kubernetes so that script i need to write and if i delete that pod everything like the container the docker script the image and the network should get deleted so that is like the first round in which i have to code everything and i have to submit it and then i had like two or three more round i, I guess and in that uh, in first round again i was asked to do the live coding where i was asked like lead code uh, medium questions where i have provided the solution for those it was live coding i had a panel in front of me and i have to write in front of them only then the second round i was asked the question on docker kubernetes and all the other infrastructures which i use means more specifically to the cloud from my backend and then in the last round i was having a i had a behavioral round and i had a backend knowledge like the technical round on the backend what is java how do you integrate it with the spring what are the other alternatives of the spring what is spring framework and all those examples hibernate jdbc what is the alternative of jdbc what is jpa so there are there were so many other questions also related to backend because cloud engineering is like combination of both if you are targeting specifically to a devops role i i do not feel like you know you will be asked questions on backend uh, it was mostly on um, cloud side actually so those those were the questions actually and then in behavior i guess uh, it was not that behavior question was like how, what what challenges you faced in your previous organization how do you handle this situation there were so many other questions and when i means i gave like interview so many for so many organizations in one of the organization i was asked to create a presentation for my entire profile what i did till now and it's basically how you are selling yourself in the terms of so like i showed you ppt and all for the cloud computing in the same way i created the ppt for myself what i did what was my previous experience what projects i undertook i gave my code snippets also to them they asked for the code snippets also like let's say i asked the, i told them okay i created this pipeline so they asked me okay what code you have written for that pipeline can you give us the because in in aws it's like a good thing if you write the infrastructure using cloud formation which is like a infrastructure as a code tool one of the tool so you will get the entire architecture diagram once your infrastructure is created so i went to my github pulled the entire code created the infrastructure again 
uh, pulled out the diagram. So I basically put the entire thing on my in my PPT and I explained everything to the panel. And if, so basically it was like panel was first understood what I did and then they start picking up the question. So <clears throat> there I had around eight or nine rounds. <clears throat> that was like for the full time, so not for the co-op actually. So yeah, these were the questions actually asked. So question depends like which team you are going, what was the, what is your role and what kind of work they're expecting from you? Because I had like a good experience in my previous uh, company. So people who were interviewing me for the internship, they wanted me to go directly into the production instead of just uh, doing some project for themselves. So I was like, on the first day itself, I was moved to the production. I was working, I, I basically production in the sense, like if you don't know uh, what is production, you develop something which is directly going to the customer. You are not doing anything internally within the organization. Okay, this can be a part of internal things in the organization, no. <clears throat> Let's say IBM had so many customers. The feature which I developed, the customers were using it. The actual customers were using, that is called as production actually. So it depends like what kind of role you are in or what kind of role you are been, uh, you have been like, you know, interviewing. So those things will definitely matter, but yeah. Keep preparing if you know everything question doesn't matter actually i never asked to anybody okay what was your uh, what question they have asked you in the internship or because i knew that okay my experience is going to be completely different than others might be they are fortunate enough that you know only two questions ask them but it might be not i'm not that fortunate enough they might ask 10 or 100 questions to me so i have to be prepared for that okay correct and always believe i have one i always keep this thing in mind whenever i give interview that organization should ask me whatever they wanted to ask. They should not select me by any fortunate or by, by any luck because I don't want them to blame themselves later on. Okay. Whom we have hired. He don't know anything. I want to, I know I like to be grilled. Actually, they should ask me everything, whatever they feel like. And <clears throat> if they are hundred percent satisfied with the answers and everything, then only they should hire me in every interview. When people, uh, the managers or the hiring manager, they ask me question. Do you have any questions for us or anything like that? I always ask them, is there anything I can work on? Is there anything I can improve on? If you have any specific thing to tell, you can let me know so that in my next interview, I do not face the same issue and I will definitely have an upper edge in that case also. So you can ask the questions which are like, you know, more sensible, more, more of related to your technical skills or profile instead of just asking some random thing because they have asked you to ask some question, okay? what's your day and how, what you did on that. They, they are not interested in that. You are not their friend. They are not your friends actually. So, yeah. Okay. For the, for the starters like me, who has uh, interest in cloud engineering with a total different background, what advice do you have for us and what topics do you have in mind going down this path? So basically, first you have to decide you want to target cloud computing, or sorry, cloud engineers role or a DevOps role because they are different actually. So cloud engineer is expected to work on developing the cloud native application as well as deploying them on the different cloud providers. DevOps, whereas has to develop the infrastructure part, scripts for deploying or automating the deployment like let's say develop, I'm a developer and you are a DevOps engineer. So I will develop the appli entire application for you, give it to you. You will take that application and deploy it on the cloud. So for that, you do not have to write the backend code under any condition. So now you have to decide in which part you are more inclined. Is it like both things appeal to you? Like for me, I want backend also, but not too much. And I want cloud also. Cloud is like something which I fall for. So you have to decide on that thing that is it like a mixture of both things you need, or it's like only scripting, automating and cloud computing you need, depending upon that, you will have two options, DevOps as well as cloud. So for starting, if you are doing us, if you're going for a cloud engineering field or cloud engineering domain, I would say, pick up a uh, programming language, example, Java associated framework, Spring Boot develop some project, get an understanding how exactly it works and then come to the part where you will take this application and deploy it on the cloud. That's it. But if you are, if you are going toward the DevOps side, start learning about the different infrastructure tools, Terraform, cl cloud formation, Ansible, Jenkins, uh, Puppet, Chef, uh, 
different providers <clears throat> aws is like one of the biggest you should always target aws you do not have to go for multiple providers in in the initial phase definitely if you get an opportunity to work on different providers you will get an exposure to that also but initially i would say start with aws because it's easy to use has very basic structure if you go to the gcp gcp is something very complex you have to create a organization then a folder then a project and then in the project you have to create your infrastructure that's like too complicated for the for the beginners actually so choose your uh, favorite uh, provider uh, take some already created applications write some uh, scripts to deploy it on that cloud and see how it works what is the some more some issue comes to you how you resolve them and you know go back to your team that okay no this is not correct you have to fix it and all those stuff so depending upon these two roles you have to decide how you have to start i would say if you have interest first do cloud practitioner there is a certification for aws you can do so that you will get in a, a basic understanding how cloud actually works what are the different kind of basic services uh, aws has to offer so you can do that certification it does not require more than two or three months for a beginner also to prepare for it uh, so those things you can do yeah so I, I would say that is like how you can plan and proceed for the i hope this answers your question i'm not able to see all the people so i i don't know how you are getting it let me know if you have any other question uh you can uh, you can okay so you can uh, always reach out to me uh, on linkedin or you can take my linkedin handle from yeah from the organizers they will give it to you and you can ask me whatever you want to ask over there uh, i can definitely able to guide you as per my understanding my knowledge which i carry and if i will not be able to answer anything i can direct you to the person or to the people who who have like more more experience than me so they will be able to help you let me know if you need any help okay another question in general terms of security in cloud engineering what are the steps by cloud engineers to take the cloud safe okay so basically uh, as i mentioned that uh, let's say you want to talk about in terms of cloud itself like what are the security measures we should take let's say you have a rds instance which means database you have you have a application where people can come and they can shop from your application now the thing is that if people are coming to your application and your application will direct that path to your database that is one of the security because you your the customers are not directly accessing your database so they will not be able to manipulate your data under any condition in this case so this data is safe from their effect they are affecting or they are targeting your application and then your application is talking to your database so data will be safe in that case one of the way of securing your data is provide the security group to the database that database please give me the request or please act or please open the doors of your database or data stores only if the traffic is coming from the application otherwise if someone else is trying to access you directly or try to open your gate directly do not open it please first thing one of the way actually second is we have to store we have to see, uh, we have to save our data only we do not have to worry about the front end code which we have written doesn't matter actually so second thing is if our database so basically in cloud what happens is there will be public subnets as well as private subnets public subnets can be accessed by anybody they are open to entire world on the uh, on the internet whereas private subnet does not have any reference in the outside world people are not aware about the private subnet what is the private subnet actually the reason for that is there is no public ip associated with the sub private subnets whereas there is a public ip associated with every public sub public subnets and all the resources at, uh, installed in that so try to put your database or sensitive information for that matter into the private subnet and keep it completely intact do not pass any public ip to your database or your sensitive information carrying resource in that way you are basically hiding everything explicitly from the outside world it's like you have 1 million dollars 
you put it into a safe and buried under your house nobody is aware of that thing there is no channel to go to that ground where you have buried your box or your safe on the other hand you have your tv remote you put it into a box which anybody can see and know okay there is a way to pull that remote from there that is called as private public subnet i hope that answers your question what are the things like how can we access the private subnet private subnet can be accessed by passing proper security group to the private subnet okay. or there is a another term called as nat nat gateway actually that will allow the access from private subnet to the outside world so first request will go to the nat and nat will populate it on the internet and net will also be there in the public cloud only because if it is in the private cloud you will again pri private subnet you will not be able to access so one thing i used to do uh, so we used to have azure blob storage and we used to copy the https url so that is to be a private itself so was https yeah yes so that is a abstraction layer you are providing on the top of your application so you're securing your application urls protocols actually you are securing So there are two types of uh, protocols: HTTP and HTTPS. Yeah. HTTPS is basically SSL based, self-signed certificates or uh, open source generated certificates that can be done in programmatic way as well as in the like for example in uh, Spring Boot. We what we do is basically we keep the security things into XMLs also. So that is called as XML security, role-based authentication. Actually, security configuration, or you can say Java security. Actually, so that is basically securing your URLs or routings at first level. That like if you are authorized, basically what happens is like let's say you have your unsecured application. If you click the URL, that URL goes and anybody can see your source code and can take out the sensitive information from that source code. So what happens is like. if you are on the secure network http as you are using that has a already a vault or an abstraction layer at the first so the hacker or someone has to pass this layer first and then at the so basically there are multiple layers of providing the security i just explained one of the thing on the in terms of cloud but there are so many uh, security steps which we have to take in terms of our application also because application code has to be stored correct yes. you you why don't you share the source code with your team or with your client because you don't want that what functionality you how you have implemented will be exposed to the client correct yes. otherwise you will lose your business so you do not lose the business so you do not pass the source code to the client correct so that's the another way of doing it i hope uh, chinmal I am not. I am Chimila. Uh, you got the answer actually. Any anything else? Please let me know. I have a question for you. When you get to a part of the interview where they ask you if you have any questions for us, what do you think are good questions to ask your class employees or DevOps? Uh, I would say it's not specific about the domain which you are targeting. It's like in general what you should ask. Let's say I am going for the interview for. cloud engineering position and they have asked so many questions from the technical terms like they asked me every corner of the things they have asked the question from every corner correct now it's my turn to ask the question so the first and foremost which is very important question as per me is what is what they are doing what for for what, for what purpose they are hiring me actually what 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 role i am going to do actually in this organization you should ask this thing very upfront so that the other person will get this sense okay he is interested in this role he is interested in what role i am going to serve and how it is going to help me technically that is very important because if you ask like okay what is the compensation if it is like less than 100k i will not be able to come that's like no no big big no no correct second important question which i feel as per me is always take the feedback that feedback is not related to your interview which you have just gave that whether you are going to hire me or not that is that 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 feedback is completely different which you will get it from the hr explicitly mention this thing to the recruiter or to the hiring manager that i don't want the feedback for this interview or for this position i am asking the general feedback on which area because you have interviewed so many people you have interviewed me also 
you have seen my skill set can you please help me out the areas where i have to work it might not be technical but it might be interpersonal so one of my as example one of my hiring manager which i had interviewed for my full time he gave me a feedback which is completely related unrelated to my technical thing he told me that it will be good if you speak little slowly when you are explaining something so that was a new thing for me because he told like okay there are so many americans here or so many people from a different country not your native and from your not from your native country so they might have difficulty in understanding what you are trying to say and you will not be able to deliver what you exactly want to deliver so you have to keep take the pose keep your pace little low so that everyone be, will be able to follow you you will be able to deliver your idea in more efficient way so that that was the feedback i got so it was completely new to me i was not aware of this thing before that because nobody told me this thing actually so th this is like the second example i would say third example uh, in one of the organization they told me about their program that you know we have this program where you have uh, some amount of money and you can target your certifications or external learning if you want to do i guess i don't want to quote the name but i remember the name of the organization so they told me this thing and i asked the question on the top of it because this shows that you are hearing them out properly you are listening what they are saying so people what they say okay interviews done now it, it's done you just leave me so that i go home and sleep but you have to listen to them properly and you have to rephrase to them so that they know this thing that okay this guy is paying attention he is following us he has heard everything whatever we we spoke so i asked this question okay can i do this thing and how much is the limit you are providing is it like there is a cap for that reimbursement which you are talking about for my education purpose or is it like you can i can because for aws certification you require 150 dollars will that be uh, under your the scheme or not or under your this uh, whatever the reimbursement policy you have so i asked those questions so basically always try to make sure that the question is something which will tell a quality of yours to the next person in that way it will be more helpful for them also to decide if you are lagging on one point and you are showing that you are willing to do that thing they might unseen that you know that one point so those are the questions actually which i personally feel to ask but the feedback question is really important actually one of my recruiter told me that okay nobody asked me this question till now so not recruit to the hiring manager because the recruiter anyways give you the feedback but you have to ask in a way that okay i am not asking whether you are going to select me for this interview or not but i am asking in general so that i can work on that thing so that in next interview i will not face the same issue or the same rejection which i am facing right now if i am going to so those kind of things you have to know Um, earlier, I made some comments on the AWS certification. Are there other certifications that you have found to be more helpful when you're doing these interviews, or like things you think you should invest your time in? Because like you mentioned, someone could cost money, and things like that. So, particularly with that, that you think are worth it. Yeah, definitely. So, I would say cloud administrative certification is there. CK cloud uh, certified cloud uh, Kubernetes administrator. So, basically, uh, on LinkedIn or somewhere in the news, tech news, I was reading like few days back. if you know cloud uh, if you know kubernetes you will never be jobless in your entire life because it's very difficult to understand but it's very useful and it will be always there because now we are on so basically we we learned how to ride a car or how to drive a car now we are not going to walk because this has given a comfort to us initially it was difficult for us to buy also and to learn how to drive but once you start learning and once you got that how to drive properly you will never go and you know walk or walk on the street or you will take the bus or public transport in the same way if you learn the kubernetes it's difficult to understand but if you learn that thing that is going to be there in the in this industry it industry forever because now nobody is going to go back to the previous era which where we have the on premises solution and keep it everything even if you are on on, on premises kubernetes is going to help you over there scaling yes orchestrating or scaling actually so that is one of the certification 
which is my personal favorite actually if i want to if i have to invest some day i i will invest in that but i would say do the certification in the way that you are gaining some knowledge from there i don't want to say all those stuff because it's recording i guess but people who have certification they don't know anything Yes. So they don't know uh, uh, anything basic stuff about the cloud. So I don't think that taking that particular paper that okay he has or she has earned that certification uh, going to make any sense because in interview they are going to actually ask you what you have done, what this service is going to do. If not, if you're not able to answer there, it does not matter you are carrying a certification. And if you're able to, I, I do not have certifications, frankly speaking. But I will be able to answer all the questions. So that's the difference between a person who has done the certification just for sake. And there are people, there are a lot of people I know who did the certification and they have very good understanding about the cloud. And I basically, whenever I have any kind of doubt, they're my good friends actually so whenever i have any doubt i always discuss with them so with that discussion i i cleared my this doubt also as well as i learned few other things also so <clears throat> if you have any other question online please let me know i have a question yeah. uh, so from a very beginner perspective, if you were to work on uh, a personal project, so uh, with respect to cloud, what could that be? Straightforward path, very straightforward path. Uh -huh. Create a CRUD application, uh -huh. any CRUD application, any language is fine for me. Uh -huh. It's for you actually, not for me. Uh, in Node or Spring or Java, whatever. Build that application, choose a provider, a cloud provider which you want to use for your deployment. Let's say AWS you used. Use a CICD tool, be it Jenkins or GitHub. GitHub is like more easy to use because it is a SaaS. Again, example of SaaS. Create a pipeline, which will take your code, create an image of it, which means Amazon machine image. Create the image of your code, put it into the AWS, and then from there, start the deployment of that image into the EC2 instance. And then send a request or try to test your API from the postman. If you don't have a UI, I'm asking about only backend, no frontend. And send a request from your postman. Will you be able to get the proper response or not? If you're getting the proper response, you are successful. And that's like one simple or basic flow of learning the entire cloud or cloud engineer rules actually because you developed application so you know backend created the pipeline deployed it and tested it you are a cloud devops engineer so backend plus the infrastructure part is a cloud engineer that's it very small straightforward so to create an image we have online to create an image you use a uh, github actions in that workflows will be written if you are using the GitHub action, there will be workflows. You write the code over there in order to create the image that, okay, pick this thing from here, pick this, that thing from here, run it on a Ubuntu machine, bundle it properly, and send it to the database. That's the way how you create the images. Got it? Online, I think they're all. Yeah. You can end it? Yeah, yeah, online. Okay.